So great. So I'm, I'm pumped about this topic. I don't know if you all saw yesterday, I did a, a quick poll um, talking about the, you know, what people's thoughts were around driving new business and driving leads and talked about customers versus outbound or inbound. And the results are pretty funny. I don't know if, if you all saw that. The results ended up being almost two thirds of people said that current customers were actually one of the best way to grow business. But for me consistently, that's just kind of not the attitude that I see, uh, you know, with companies and when it comes to account, you know, really growing their business or account, you know, kind of growth or segmentation. So I think, you know, it's a really telling sign, I think, of where people realize the importance and are, you know, maybe, maybe we'll start to kind of change some attitudes, you know, from the conversation today or the conversation that we're going to have. So Chrissy and Mike, I appreciate you joining me as we talk through, you know, account planning, account growth, why maybe you should spend just as much time on that as you do on like your outbound playbook. So, so I'll, I'll kind of kick it off here with, for both of you, you know, what, what do you think is the importance of account planning and territory planning? And, you know, maybe if you feel free, if you want to, you know, Chrissy, you can start here of just, you know, what's the difference that you feel like between account planning and territory planning? Why is it so important? Um, and I think that that would be a good way to just kind of like get the, the stage set. Yeah, sure. So I think at a high level for both of them, it's about standardization and scale and focus, right? How do I focus in order to standardize and then scale? Um, and you have to do that a certain way in order for it to be effective. And so I'll, I'll start with territory because I think that leads into account planning a little bit more. So with territory, right, it's trying to focus whether it's on account segmentation in certain states or just certain states in general, right? Um, where, you know, who you're going to sell to within a specific um, you know, geographic location that's outlined. And that's important for sales folks to ensure that they're focusing on that addressable market within that area so you can scale, right? And not get caught up in, you know, if you have the whole US or um, a really large territory, right? Or region, like the, the challenge with that is you're only focused on what's warm and not working things that like aren't in front of you, right? So it forces you know, salespeople to be hunters when they're in territories, which is great and helps with scaling. Um, and then the account planning piece, right? That kind of goes, I think about that more from the, the rep level. And I know Mike has a lot of really great thoughts on this. Um, and from that point of view, it's really kind of going, what are my like key accounts that I want to, you know, go after what's my strategy um, of how I'm going to go after them, right? Um, and and really try to open those doors um, and focus on getting into like one of my top 10 accounts or whatever that looks like. So, because if you have, you know, depending what type of company you work at, right? Like if it's really, they don't have like accounts that you, you know what you're going into, you have to find those accounts. It's always good to have like your top five or top 10 larger ones that fit your ICP that are going to take a lot of work, but like keep you focused to hit one of those whales, so. All right, Mike, same, same question to you. How do you think about these things? And, and then I think we'll go in um, to maybe a few things you talked about. Actually, Christy, even like how you started it around that allowing you to focus, which I think is a, a big important piece of this that sometimes gets overlooked and kind of share a few stories from a, a customer interaction I had last week. But, but first, Mike, what about you, man? Like, what do you think about the difference, either the difference between account planning or territory planning and and you know why it's important, what goes well, what people need to think about if maybe they've never done this before. Sure, yeah. From from a territory planning perspective, I think that's that's where you need to be aligned um, at the executive level, right? So when you start to look at territories and you break them up by geo, um, as Chrissy was talking about, there's going to be multiple sets of customers when you start to segmentate or the segmentation process, whether you're going at mid or enterprise. So from a territory perspective, right, it's really, it's really key important to be lined um, with the executive and the executive team on how that goes out. Um, from a, an account planning perspective, right, if you don't have an account plan for your key accounts or your book of accounts, you really don't have an understanding of what you're going to be doing on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis, right? 
what is it? What is your what is your um, contact strategy? What is your multi-threading strategy? Right, all of those are important externally, but they're both important internally. Right, so as you start to work with other parts of the business, where are you bringing them in to help you with the communication strategy or the meeting strategy? How are you aligning your attack process, your cadences? Right, what is the messaging that you're using, um, and at an account level, and then all of that should roll up into your strategic territory alignment. Yeah, and, and you mentioned something, and I'm going to come back to what is, I, I just want to kind of, you mentioned geo, right? And, and I have a question. I mean, maybe it's a question for both of you. You know, when you think about territories today, and we think about kind of trends, how, how important is geography-based territories in 2021? Or how relevant maybe is a better question? Because it's a, it's probably it's probably one of the most common. It's right. It's kind of like verticalized or territory, right? And you know, I've been at companies that went from a ter, you know, a, a geo focus to a vertical focus. Um, you know, why? How important is it? How important is geo today? When you think about kind of all these, in, you know, we're all you know still pretty much inside sales. Yeah, I I think it's still really important, right? I think there's a difference in selling over Zoom versus traveling, right? Like in the world that we're in um, and, and like that being more acceptable if you can do that um, versus face-to-face -face when, when it makes sense. But um, I think with territories, the one thing, like I like territories more than verticals. It really depends on the industry you're in, right? Like verticals, you've really got to make sure it's super clear. So there's not a bunch of overlap with your sales teams because I see so many companies overcomplicate that and then they have their salespeople that they're fighting against each other and what they're trying to focus on. And it really kind of takes away from the overall goal of focus, right? There's just a bunch of distraction. But I think with territories in particular, and Mike and I have actually talked a little bit about this, you have to really make sure that you have data to understand how you're doing that geo. I always tell people, um, and I've done this personally with my sales teams, if you don't have really strong data to kind of understand what your territory makeup should be, you really should start with regions and have people within those regions so you can get that data to understand what that looks like. Um, and then and then go to territories in the future because you know it's it's hard to put numbers in place and salespeople want to be successful, right? Even if you're like, we're trying to figure this out, that's not like the DNA of a salesperson. They want to be able to be successful. So I always like trying to, to go to regions first. If we don't have a data, you can break those up, but it gives people the opportunity to be successful with the unknown of what states are going to be heaviest or what verticals are going to be heaviest um, for your company. But I think in today's world, I think geos are still important, right? And they give you that structure of where you're going, even if you know, you're know you located somewhere else in the country, right? I think if you need to travel and be there you know, every once in a while or, or be there consistently, that's even more important. But Sure. Mike, what about you? What about you yeah. when it comes to, to video? Or yeah, to, no, so to, to, to verticals versus, versus geo. Yeah, we're the advent of like the global account manager. Uh, we are seeing that a lot, especially in the enterprise space that are covering multiple geos because it just gives them now with Zoom, gets them extra reach into say, you know, North America, Latin America, where there's only a one or two hour uh, time difference. You can certainly start reaching across different time zones one way or the other, right? One up or one down based on a, a time for the global account manager. I think you also have to look at, is your product super transactional? If it's super transactional and you have a, you're, you're managing 400 accounts from an inside sales perspective, right? I think geo becomes really important and they need to be locked in a specific geo in a specific time zone, just by virtue of the amount of touches that they have to make on a daily and weekly basis. All right, I'm gonna ask the audience here what they do, vertical or geo, or maybe, you know, as you get bigger, it's kind of, it ends up being almost like a hybrid, I think. I'll tell you, I'll tell you like my, my counter argument for the flip is, I think you're right. I think that the answer is like, it, it also depends on how verticalized your product is, right? If your product only sells into one vertical, right? <laughs> or like two verticals and like, you know, geo, makes sense. The, the, the flip side is, and when I was at Career Builder when we made the shift from our inside group from geo to vertical, and, and the, the main piece is that if you're in a product that sells to a lot of different buyer personas, 
in, you know, again, like imagine my team is in the Pacific Northwest. And so we're selling into tech, uh, pest companies, uh, trucking, logistics, operations, aerospace, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think, I think vertical is better because it's so much easier for me to get, I'd rather them have people in five different states that are all in aerospace because the knowledge is so difficult. Sure. Sure. You know, like, and, and, and I think that that, that's what I would think about. It's like, if it's a very similar ICP, very similar groupings, I'm, I'm all for geo, but when it starts to get to where you sell to a lot of different verticals, I just think geo is too hard. I mean, I, well, I mean, look, we did it. And, and I thank God that actually I had that because it made me super dangerous yeah. in a lot of scenarios. Cause I could then go and talk to a lot of different people about their business and I'm glad, but I also definitely saw that it, it led to longer ramp times um, yeah. for, for certain reps. But I definitely, I think, I think, you're, I think that the, the answer you said is it, it's a mix of both is, is probably right. But I, but that's how I would think about it. Maybe for some people listening, it's like geo to me makes a ton of sense when it's a very similar ICP, you know, or, or sorry, buyer persona and maybe ICP. Um, and maybe in certain industries where vertical is, if you're selling across quite a few, maybe vertical is a better move for you. The, the one thing, can I say one thing on that? Cause I, I agree with you. So it, this is important for vertical or territory, but especially vertical. Cause I've been at a company that did this right. And you might have a lot of different industries, but you've got to have like really tight rules of engagement for your sales team because so it's clear that, Hey, what if, what if someone, what if there's actually a case where it technically could fall under two industries, depending on what they do, right? Like, how do you handle that? How do you make sure, like, and I know that that seems like that would never happen, but obviously no, it makes a ton things of sense. do occur more than, and so I think it sounds great when leaders put that out there and like, Hey, I want to go ahead and do um, you know, verticals and here's our spaces. And they don't think about all the things that can happen in the middle that can be the distractions. And I'm just really big on try to limit the distractions, try to make things as black and white as possible. The more gray you have, the more time people live in those gray areas. It's just human. And also the reality of what that looks like. And then you're not focused on your outcomes, um, where it's like selling to the specific side. Right. So, um, that's, that's a great way to help keep people focused in geos, but also in verticals, right? Is it's really clear how we handle this situation. Cause I saw someone else ask a comment about what happens if like a account is a- Let's you know, do it. Let, let, let's take the question here. here. Yeah. Yeah. They said their headquarters are here, but they have state, they have all these offices located somewhere else. And that goes back to your rules of engagement, right? Like if, if it's, you own this whole account, you know, in North America, like that's how, so um, that's a great way to do it, especially if you have BDRs and you have a national account um, individual um, in, in headquarters is how you define that. Like you've got to really go back to rules of engagement, what works best, right? Sometimes, um, you know, if it's like someone in mid-market or whatnot, you've got to really look at what's the best way to manage that for the business and then put those in your rules of engagement, right? So it's not subjective. You can't have people coming to you with different business cases and not focusing on the sale and, you know, going forward with their accounts. Right. Well, how would you tackle this question specifically? So Matt, so we got a question here and again, everyone feel free to keep dropping your questions. I always tell people to be selfish in these and, and ask questions. It says, the question is, if a target account has offices in multiple markets, what is your recommendation to handle a situation where an AE for market A creates, closes an op where the primary HQ offices in market B belongs to a different AE. How do you typically like assume that you've got some, what would be the most standard in this scenario? What would be the most standard rules of engagement here? Yeah, I, I would say when it gets down to account planning, right, it's really, we've got to, we've got to start thinking how the customers buying and acquiring our goods and our goods or services and set up the rules of engagement around that and make sure during your account planning process that it's clear that the lines around the business and the way that they operate and they purchase are 100% crystal clear. So you're not, you're not tripping over. And that's where the communication and the multi-threading internally is super important because if, if you don't have that and understand where that purchase needs to be made or how it's going to be made, then you're going to have situations where people are going to be doing double work and saying that they're, that they're, they're both going after the same type of opportunity when in reality, it's one centralized purchasing process, purchasing process. 
but but is that how you would dictate it though i mean based on because then that would be account by account versus geo in this scenario what would you say make a call make a call in this scenario um and this can be mike or chrissy two reps one owns the hq opportunity there's obviously again this is the same thing it's a multinational company right what's what is the most typical way you would see this rules of engagement breakdown mike do you want to go? i've talked a lot so go ahead go ahead um I mean, I, his, I would look at the purchasing setup. If it's one centralized purchasing, it goes to rep A who owns the headquarter. If there's a lot of like, basically if there's different purchasing setups, meaning that you're going to have to resell it, you have, Hey, I bought it from this person. They'll introduce me. Then you can look to do it to rep, to rep B by geo. Right. So I think if there's centralized purchasing and consistency there, like that's, that all day, like should be with the same person. Um, the other side, you could do both, but in this case, if it's so big and like one person can't manage all of it because they're not national accounts, then do what's best. What if they are national accounts? What if they are national? What if, what if we've done our territories, right? Cause I think that that's the, the, the real question here is like, okay. when it comes to ownership, who should own it? You know, because again, unfortunately, like I, like I said, I, I feel like with, with what you're saying, like the rules of engagement would then vary by account. As opposed to like, what most commonly would you do? Let's say they're mid, it's a mid-market account or national account. I would let I would let Rep A own it all the way. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. I'm in the same boat. Like, if if you are going to move to a headquarter-based model to where the whatever headquarters the geo is in is what does it, then Rep A wins. Yeah. And but I here's what I will tell you though, and because I know Matt's situation a little bit, there is also a time period that you should not have territories. Like my friends, like there's a lot of data, a lot of data that shows that in the early days when you over territory yeah. companies, you un, you penalize top performers yeah. and underperformers because again, Chris, you know, Chris, you spent time in trucking. Guess what? If you've got Tennessee versus, versus, versus North Dakota, like you, uh, you are already starting at a massive advantage. Why? Because there's a lot of trucking companies that are headquartered mm -hmm. in Tennessee. And so- my, my one word of caution here, and maybe this can be the question too, when do you move to this territory model? And then I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll kind of flip to account planning, but I think let's put a pen in some of the territory stuff sooner than later. You know, when is the right time for territories? Because I see people do it too soon yes. too, and it hurts. Yeah, totally. So I can tell you what we did at the trucking company and it worked really well, right? And we grew incredibly fast. And um, we came in and it was very much wild, wild west, right? Like everyone was just like scrambling, grabbing accounts. And so um, they, the, you know, the executive team had wanted to move to territories. Um, and I give them credit for this because they actually had this conversation with us, were open to it. And I said, I don't want to move to territories right away because we don't have any data. We don't know anything, right? And that's yeah. the biggest mistake. Um, let's make sure we set up a model so we can actually hit our number because that's the outcome and we can get the data. And so what we did is we created, created three regions really based off like time zone, right? So there was like the West, Central and East, right? And then um, we put like pods of reps in there. And for inbound leads, they had round robin. Um, and then they could only have though, because the region is so big, you know, every, our rules were like, you know, you can't just have like a million accounts in your name. You get 200 accounts that you get to go after. Right. And if something is dead and you don't want to come back and, you know, use it, like move it out of your name. Right. Close lost was um, something that anyone could go after in the future. Right. So it pushed them to keep their sales force updated um, and, and also focus appropriately in a big region. And so that's how we were able to. And then we coached them like, hey, like, let's let's also look at the data where we, you know, Texas was like a super hot market. Right. So hey, focus here, but like, let's try to go into these states and figure out like what that opportunity is, right? Because we just haven't reached out to those areas. And so after doing that for two years, then we had enough data to then put people in smaller regions or it was like a year and a half, like smaller regions that were more concentrated. And then by the third, I think the middle of the third and a half, you know, the middle of the third year was when they went to like full on territories, right? And that worked really well because people had already been building relationships with customers they were able to have you know a worked territory of some sorts and we knew what the strong states were so um it, it took you know almost four years to get to that point but by no means did it ever hurt 
um, the goals and you had reps that were a ton more happy or a lot more happy because they were able to actually be successful and they saw that plan. Right. And they were never like, man, I'm not hitting numbers. And these things are out of my control. It was I'm hitting numbers. Um, and I see where they're going. And so I know that that's my motivation to like really dig in to understand the territory better. So. Yeah, I think is you know, the size of the organization and by function of the sales role can certainly, you can certainly have vertical expertise at the account manager level, but you can also have right geo territories for the, the SDR, the BDR, the inside sales teams as well, right? Because they can reach further, more accounts. They, they're less restricted on their access because they, they've set up their playbook in a way that they can cover multiple geos, but they can also partner with companies that have vertical expertise as well, which means they do have to wear a couple of different um, hats within their, with their segmentation, but that's okay because the inside seller at some point can manage, you know, four to 500 um, accounts within their book just because of their reach, right? As opposed to maybe a vertical and an enterprise seller may have the top 50 accounts that they're managing at that time. Yeah. And, and I think as we kind of like shift gears here, so I think to kind of put a pin in some of the territory planning piece is um, there is such a thing as too soon. Um, it might sound good on paper to want to keep things clear, but instead, I think to Chrissy's example, you can actually create really clear rules of engagements without having these like micro territories early on, you know, that you don't necessarily have to to do that, you can just think of again, and, and I think you know what Chrissy is talking about is more of like a cult, like a named account approach, where it's like if people are in these areas and they had their kind of named accounts, but they might be a little bit all over, and then as the data fleshes out, the kind of the pockets start to form, um, mm -hmm. and I think that that's a strategy I've seen be very successful early on. Is like to your point, Chrissy, as long as um, as long as everybody has the named account and knows that this person's account is here, and like you said, your data is decent, you know, you can avoid some of it you know, yeah. early on, because the, the alternative is over bureaucratizing your sales organization too early to the detriment of it, yeah. um, which is, which is something I've seen. So, so I think I, I wanted to, I want to kind of shift gears to talk a little bit about account planning. There's something in here, Mike, um, I'll, I'll decorate this one to you, which is like why your largest accounts are not always your top accounts. I think a lot of times when it comes to account planning, you know, what I've seen in organizations is, is people just, well, this is a fortune 500. This is a you know Fortune 100 or Fortune 1000, and by the way, it's not that those not necessarily shouldn't be like some of your top accounts. But what do you you know in this question here, like when 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 I ask the question, why are your largest accounts not always your top accounts? What does that mean to you? Yeah, so there's a couple of different things, right? Once you get down and you start researching these companies, they may not align with your product set, which means they they may have different types of purchasing requirements that maybe you're accustomed to which puts you outside of the box, right? If you're a 30 day receivable and they've got uh, 120 days, that just may not line up with, uh, with you know, your, your selling motion or your collection motion. So that's one. So you really got to understand um, you know, where they are from a purchasing perspective. And if they're decentralized and you know, they're making independent uh, um, decisions, decentralized, and you as a rep cannot cover that many decentralized locations, that may not be a good product fit for you as well if you don't have the staff um, or the size of the sales teams to be able to pursue that. So I think the biggest challenge is, do you know your customer? Do you understand their buying process, how they buy, where they buy, and when they buy is the biggest thing that you've got to, you've got to recognize as a rep to see if it, if it fits into your um, your organization selling process. And do you feel again? Yeah. And I, I think it's also about, yeah, you, you, Brent, you mentioned it. It's like also like there's a, a propensity to buy and that, and the propensity to buy is not just dependent on size. You know, I like to use a term called X factor, which is like, actually because FinTech is exploding or whatever, FinTech companies under this size are actually also a tier one. Right. And so I think it's about coming up with this idea that it's not just the largest. There's probably some other factors that could go into somebody being a potential top account. Yeah, I would uh, say you know, opportunity for growth. Right. And and uh, market share, you know, all of those go into it. And if you're not doing the the diligence to understand if 
only one product in your portfolio fits with inside that organization, as opposed to other ones that may look like it, where you have the ability to sell four products in your portfolio into that. I would take the one that's got four products and make that a top account, which it may be smaller, like you said, right? It may be a mid-market account uh, that has the ability to buy for, you know, your products align within four different uh, um, parts of the organization, as opposed to maybe one. Um, I would take that four as opposed to one, even though the four is, looks a lot bigger on surface. What do you, so so maybe it, maybe it, to kind of take a step back and not know, or maybe it's, it's kind of dovetails. So what goes into good account planning? So, all right, so I have a, my book of business. And I think this is probably what a lot of people are thinking. Okay, I've got my book of business, right? And you can think about scoring my accounts. We're talking about these ideas of how to kind of put people into like a tier around like what would be a top account. But what do you like? What are some of the key elements of good account planning? You know, and again, it could be time of year. It could be what the things that you're prepping for. Like, what are some of like your top? And let's just we can kind of have each of you do it. Maybe you know, Mike, if you want to go like your top two or three must-haves for good account planning, and then Chrissy, yeah, I'd love to hear yours as well too. Yeah, my 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 top two are how well do they fit with inside my ideal customer profile? Right? Are they and do they look similar to other organizations within um, our portfolio, and do they act the same way? And the the uh, the personas that we're dealing with, right? How many buyers within uh, the buying group are there with each one of these accounts? You absolutely need to know this because there may be two buyers in one account, there may be six in another account, and until you have that mapped out and understand that process you're going to be spinning your wheels and selling to the wrong people. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Like to, to piggyback off that, because I think you have to do what Mike says first, right? That's so important. Um, I always took the approach, especially with my enterprise teams, of using that CHAMP acronym, like similar to BAND, because I think you've got to have a way of how you're always keeping up to date with that account that's realistic versus like filling out a spreadsheet every time. And so always understanding what the challenges are. Is the pain changing? Um, who are all the players and really trying to, you know, cause I think a lot of people just try to do that on the front end and then they kind of stop that process. Um, and then understanding timeframes, all those, all those pieces, right. And really making sure you constantly have a good grasp of that information in a way that you can put that in your CRM or, you know, consistently have that. So, um, you're updating it and you're keeping track of like where everything is and selling. Um, and then my favorite thing to do is always, you know, you should always know how do I lose this deal, right? Um, when you're, you know, working in that account, because that has always shown me and, and my teams where the most risk lies. If you don't know the answer to that question, um, that's like one of the first things you need to go figure out. So I love that one. Yeah. And I think we're so scared at times. I feel like teams purposely don't un want to understand that, that question. They're like, yeah. if I don't, if I don't ask if the competition's in here, or if I don't ask, then like, it just doesn't exist. Or yeah. if I don't have the tough conversation around pricing, then it just, you know, I can just, you know, act like it doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think, I think some of the things I, yeah, I, I would add is like, again, because sometimes in these big accounts, it's not, you know, two or six buyers. I mean, there's like 25 or 30 yeah. different buyers. Right. And, and I think the key is, you know, for me, it's always about just kind of getting that lay of the land of, you know, the very first question whenever I'm doing account planning with the team, as I said, how does this company make money? How do they make money? Okay, because if I understand how they make money, I can then start to think about, and again, it could be the, to your point before, because this division makes money this way. Okay, how would we fit in there? How can we do, okay, this division makes money this way. Okay, uh, you know, how do we fit with that? And I think I always start there. You know, I always start, how does this company make money when I'm doing an account plan? Because yeah. then that will help me to understand, again, and when I'm talking about these kind of bigger companies where things can get like very messy, um, yeah. how can I then start to identify, okay, well, this vision does this, like, you know, okay, is that where we want to start? Or is that how we should think about it? Is that where we can get an in? You know, or the other groups that, to Mike's point, that maybe better fit our, you know, previous customer use cases. Um, and then from there, it's just breaking it down to what, what I call an action plan, which is, you know, I was doing a session with a, a, a multinational company last week. And, you know, it's like, what are your goals for And, and that's kind of my, my, my number two is like, what are your goals for the account? I think too often what happened is we, we don't, when we do an account plan, we don't actually have a strategy. We work the thing forward versus saying, 
look, by the end of this year, I want to have a PO in front of this company for half a million dollars. Cool. Right. Amazing. Great. Or like, let's say the current customer, I want to grow this current customer relationship by, you know, on December 31st by 15%. Great. Amazing. Right. And now work it backward. And I feel like that, that is kind of the other big issue that I see with most account plans is people in, you know, they're constantly not really aligned on what they actually want to accomplish, like sell more stuff, which isn't really a strategy as opposed to, okay, what are the pockets? Who are the people involved? This is where I want to try to end up. What are the meetings and steps and things that I need to do and milestones in order to get there? Yeah. And I think my most successful reps um, mastered that. Yeah. They really ma mastered that kind of goal setting timeline and milestone management because then we're just like working the plan. Right. Uh, it's like and, that backwards timeline, right? Like you have to understand it and you have to make sure your customer understands it. So you're on the same page of what that looks like towards success or when that's not going to happen. Right. And you can easily you know, see that in the future. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really project management of yeah. your plan. Right. And the thing is the thing to, to not do, right. Is you can't make it over complicated. You got to start off simple because if it's too big at the onset and you're trying to do too many things, you will not do too many things, right. It's going to be way over complicated. You need to start out with the basics. I love the action plan. I love understanding how they make money, but also how is your product or service going to help them make more money, right? It could be better, faster, and more efficient. So how do you link your product and service back to the company yeah. and how it's going to help them, right? And then the other is the competitive side of the business. You're right, Jake. We fail to ask if our competition is in there. Sometimes it's easy to spot, right? But also sometimes it's not because they may be in another division doing business that we're not talking to. So how do you connect with those other divisions to understand, again, who's purchasing, what are they purchasing, when are they purchasing it? And then you can start to fill that in on your account plan and really have some strategic drivers to make some headway into those accounts. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking right now. I'm going to drop a quick link in here for people if they're interested. This is a very basic, you know, uh, like account plan template to... Um, that people can kind of take a quick mm -hmm. look at. Mike, you you saying that reminds, it's like a, I remember a, a long time ago when I was a, an AE, um, I was I was selling to Google and it's a massive company, but it was, it ended up only being like 30K. It was super small because our product only aligned to like a certain part of their, their business, which was super small. And we, the amount of legal red lines and the amount of work I had to do on that account should have made like, you know, multi-million dollar sale, right? So it was a big learning lesson for me. Um, but it's a perfect example where you can have this like big, one of the biggest companies in the world, right? And like your product um, or your service, whatever you're offering, it's just, it's not going to be enough. And in this case, it really, outside of the logo, um, was it worth it to go through all that for that amount, you know, versus focusing on companies that, they may not have that prestige or that name, but they're going to be able to become so much larger um, for you in, in capturing that market share and revenue. So, yeah, that's right. If you're so, but you know, in reverse, if your product set is a $30,000 product set, then that makes sense to go for right. it. Right. But right, if, you're, right, sure. if your average contract value um, or the average value of each deal is up words of 500,000 and you're only going to get a 30,000 PO, right? You got to be able to know when the cut bait on that. And, move and that's all planning uh, on the onset to understand yeah, that. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And, and, and another thing I want to talk about, we've talked about this and I'll kind of share a story about, you know, my days as a, a national account manager is that each account, you know, I call it is going to be a massive you know, five million dollar, half million, two million dollar top down, or I got to go pick up a shit ton of quarters. And, and I had accounts like that. And I think with a lot of people, especially it depends on like the, getting the product mix that you have, you know, and, and if you have a decentralized buying process, then guess what? That's the process. The process is you got to go and go find a 10,000. I, you know, I, I was working with the largest um, private healthcare company in the state of California. And so we had a, and I had a quota, right? My quota was like, okay, here's what they did last year. And here's your number for next year, right? And, 
you know, I think they were, I think the contract was like 350,000 at the corporate level, but man, I had to go around. I would, I've driven to every random place in California, $10,000 deal with this hospital, $5,000 deal with this hospital, $20,000 deal. And I agree that I almost doubled that account right? because an account plan and account planning. It, and again, it goes back to like understanding, okay, there's 40 hospitals in the network. Okay. The corporate buys this, they're purchasing this, like, okay, shit. All right, what's the product mix I can go and sell individually? Yeah. You know, to these individual groups. And it was a 10,000 deal here, a 15 here, a five here. And that sometimes that's how account planning works. And yeah. sometimes when you keep trying to go for this really big deal, it's never going to happen. As opposed to, because I also think about with account planning and account strategy, I think multi year. Too yeah. many people, they're, they're just thinking about here or there. I'm thinking about how I'm going to be playing my chess pieces to then in a year and a half go say, hey, did you know your other hospital is spending $200,000 and it's costing you procurement about an extra 50? Can we roll this into one? You know, and sometimes that's how you have to do it. You got to go out and like build champions in this pocket, build champions in this pocket, build champions in this pocket, and then try to roll this thing up. And I think too many, when I see enterprise reps, they don't realize that it's, it's, Sometimes it's an or. Okay, this one, I'm going to go this strategy up top, big deal, trickle down. This strategy, I'm going to go build you know, some groups or some pockets of usage, wait three to six months, and then try to build it up. Yes. And, and that to yeah. me is probably the most underlooked at piece of account planning from my experience. Oh, I 100% agree with you. It, it, it brings back memories um, from another company where really large co- organization, everyone had tried to go to the top, could never get in because they weren't going to mandate it globally um, with an MSA, but by going to a couple of individual sites at this organization, they loved what we did. We were able then to get intro directly to the top and say, just do an MSA here. And then the sites can still make the decision, but the legal work's already done. And so we were able to accomplish that from that way. But yeah, I think people really underestimate um, how valuable that, you know, bottoms up strategy can be. Um, and it also creates, you know, you don't ever want to be in a situation where you're panicking and you're trying to work an account because it's all that you have, right? So you've got to have some different options and strategies so you can always be smart with how you go after it. Yeah, and it, and it removes a lot of that variability. I guess that, that that's actually kind of a good consequence, right? It's like when you're always waiting for that six figures to drop or whatever, then that yeah. means you're going to have, whereas like, I, I, you know, that just didn't happen to me. <laughs> like I constantly had 50 to 60 or 70K coming in from these little like yeah. new proof of concepts or deals in a month to where it eliminated that variability. Cause yeah. I was always planting seeds and maybe that's, you know, as a function of how they did comp plans too, which is smart in retrospect. Um, you have a good point, Jake. It's, you know, how are you compensating your, your account team in, you know, bringing in the business, right? Cause if everybody's going for the home run and you're not hitting singles, right. You're just, that home run could be six months down the road. Right. You hit you hit enough singles. Right. That, you know, Tony Gwynn hit, you know, three thousand, four thousand singles. He's in the Hall of Fame, didn't hit too many home runs. But right. The he was able to stack and stack and stack and stack, which in turn builds a story for the corporate conversation, because you can walk in and say, look, I'm doing business in in your instance, Jake, 15 of your 20 hospitals. What would it look like if we consolidated this under one master agreement and got all 20 hospitals involved? That's where the conversation heads back up to the corporate location. Exactly. Yeah. And then sometimes it just is what it is. And sometimes like, you know, you're only going to do that. And and again, in like in, in larger companies, I don't care what product you sell. There are probably a hundred different entry points. And I think too often people get locked in on and not creative, you know, like like I think about a good account plan is like the first step is, you know, like, let's say we're getting ready to go into the new year um, or we've got a big renewal coming up with them in, you know, six to nine months. It's, it's getting creative. It's thinking outside the box. It's like, okay, well, what can we do here? How can we kind of beautiful mind this thing to like here? And that look with this account, I'm just going to keep, you know, again, clipping coupons, just like boop, 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 boop. And like, that's what it's going to be. Yeah. And like, I'm not going to get that. And I think, again, I see a lot of people, the, the other trend I see in account plans is people try to kind of skip over a proof of concept or some type of proof of scale and go straight toward, you know, oh, we're going to close this big deal. It's like, 
dude, if someone is spending $25,000 with you, the chances they're going to then just go like, yeah, we'll write you a check for half a million or a million <laughs> is pretty slim. And, and I think that that's probably to me, one of the more forgotten parts of account plans is what is your you know, proof of concept process look like, you know, I, when you're thinking about that. Yeah. You gotta, it, you all bring up such excellent points on this because it's, I always say like good strategy is not always sexy, right? It's like, and, and you really have to like leave your ego at the door and go, is this going to make me feel better because I want to be looked at in a way, or is this going to make me feel better because I'm actually hitting my goals, right? So like, you really have to have that honest conversation with yourself. And sometimes that's hard because you don't always have leadership that's pushing you to make that decision correctly on how you go after things. Um, but yeah, you, you really have to, you know, strategy is not always aligned with like making your ego feel, you know, look good or, um, or, or, or being the big home run that I think everyone wants, but like the reality is it's not always super common, right? Maybe in some industry, sure. But, um, or some companies, but in a lot, that's just not, you know, the reality for a lot of sales folks. Yeah. Cause the, the, the strategy, the answer is it's both. And that's where I think a good account plan comes into place is that you kind of start to map, is this going to be a bottom up, a top down, yeah. a hybrid, how am I going to use proof of concepts as I think about some of these milestones? Uh, yeah, there's definitely, your ego is definitely in check when you're in Bakersfield, California, uh, at, <laughs> you know, the second hospital and, and then you're driving to like Fresno, uh, you know, like four, 300 miles. So trust me, I was, we were putting in the work. Um, okay, so let, let's, I want to talk maybe kind of wrapping up here a little bit, maybe about account segmentation. So we talked about territory planning, right? We talked about geo, vertical, when to think about it, how to think about it, what's too soon. I think we've got some good stuff there. We've talked about you know, some of these account planning, um, but let's talk maybe about this concept of account segmentation. I use the word tiering a lot, which is this concept, and Chrissy, I'm gonna kind of come full circle because you brought it up in your very first answer, um, is this concept of how you, I, how I think about this, this the simplest way, is what are the proactive touch points that you're gonna have with your customer over the life cycle of working with them? and dividing those into segments based on propensity to spend and current spend. And however you define propensity to spend, I think can get fun and, and interesting. Um, you know, what, it, it, Chrissy, I'll start with you on this one. What, why is account segmentation so important? So I think it really, it, a, a couple of things I'll go, I'll start with, I think what's really actually valuable is career pathing for your sales work. So it's it, account segmentation, an example that I'm going to use it in, um, not that it can't be done other ways, but like when you do it from like a SMB, like a transactional, more transactional sales, um, you know, from maybe like one to a hundred employees or, you know, the, the size of the, the company or the revenue that they have, um, and then mid-market and enterprise, right? Those types of segments require um, different, you know, sales skill sets, right? And so yeah. making sure that people know constantly, you know, it's, it's, it's similar to the vertical, right? They know how to sell to that type of customer. They know the time frame is going to be different and the time it takes to close the deal, the amount of stakeholders they're working with, right? And it's a great way to build your bench um, for people that you know can move up, right? So they get really good at mastering this segment and then they they're starting to get visibility and see internally and they can move up to this one, right? So, you know, people are really big on career pathing and want to know how they can grow and get better. And so that gives you just a natural way to um, promote individuals and drive them for that. And then, um, you know, uh, different from territory planning, account segmentation, you can do, I think, actually very quickly um, and, and have a lot of organization focus there and success without putting things um, in place that are really going to like hurt your top salespeople, right? So um, I am all for account segmentation. I think it's great. It helps us narrow in our focus. It helps us get really good at knowing, you know, the type of companies we're selling to um, and that sales cycle and, and um, you know, also having options of how we grow, right? And, and what those look like. Yeah, I think, you know, Jake, you talked about the tiering. I think tiering is super important because you, you we as sales reps, account managers, right? SDRs, BDRs, we all need to understand where we're going to be spending our time. Yeah. And if without segmentations and tiering, right, your, your tier one customer, you may have a majority of the wallet share and there's not a lot of opportunity for growth. So that is a completely different touch strategy, engagement strategy, 
executive strategy than maybe your B accounts where there's bigger upside, you have less market share, but you may not have the large revenue number, but you can, you're able to penetrate that, that account with multiple products, right? So you should be spending your time, different touch sequence, different communication sequence, right? And that all rolls up into your forecasting, right? Segmentation and tiering is critical for a forecast and what plays you're going to be running on a weekly, monthly basis so you can report on it. As Jake mentioned earlier, right? What are the little things that you're going to do that are going to add up to the bigger slice of business within that account? And if you don't tier them and you treat everything equally, you're not going to get the same results. Yes. Yeah. And it, and it's just fucking chaos. I mean, it's like <laughs> what I, what I see, you know, is actually, it's interesting. I was talking, I mean, again, it's funny because some of our larger clients, you know, have the most like, you know, areas of opportunity. Cause like they've got such good product market fit or, you know, they've kind of been the beast in an industry for a long time. And, you know, I was talking to a group um, at a APAC last week and um, we, well, we talked about this concept of account segmentation and tiering. And it's like, oh my gosh, that would be amazing. It's like, yeah, I know. Like, then you'd never have to think about who to follow up with and when, and oh shit, I forgot to follow up because everyone's been there, right? We've all been there when it's like, oh, oh, I forgot to follow up with, you know, this people or those people, right? We've all, we've all had that happen. But to me, it's, it's about just your proactive touch points with your customer. You're going to be interacting with them. But you know, and, and what we would do at, you know, just thinking back to Glassdoor, Chart, actually every company I've ever been a VP, um, you know, we, we start the customer, the very first kickoff call saying like, great. So look, so over the course of the next X period, we're going to have these meetings on a consistent basis, right? And why I want to get these in now to make sure that, that I have the time set aside for us to be able to sit down and talk strategy. And, you know, so often I think one of the issues I see with teams when they try to do account tiering or account segmentation is the the meeting rhythm gets disrupted really early because they're not adding any value in the relationship. And I think one of the actual biggest issues that I see with account tiering and segmentation is people can't continue the proactive outreach because customers stop wanting to meet with them because they're not adding any value. Um, and, you know, after you have like four, you know, the first three to four months of, of check-in catch up touch base meetings, mm -hmm. and that maybe that can be our follow on is how to run effective QBRs and uh, you know, monthly business reviews. Um, but I do feel like that's one of the big issues I see with account segmentation is that companies I see will come up with tiers, but adoption is low, meaning like people actually hitting the milestones in the meetings because of the quality of interaction that the sales team or account management team is having with the customer. Yeah, yeah, you can build those cadences, right? You can have multiple cadences built into your sales tools to help you along with that and prompt you on yeah. where you are and what you need to and build that into your CRM and your and your enablement tools, right? So at the end of the day, you, you're not putting all the thought into it because you've worked the plan at the beginning and then you just need to iterate as you go through based on the results. We we used to have a rule a rule at a company that I worked at and we and we uh, put it out to our teams like you cannot have check-in calls. Check-in no. calls are pointless and they add no value to anyone but potentially you. And it goes back to like just meetings, right? It's like you need to very clearly define what is the purpose and outcome of why we're getting on this call. So they know why they agree with it. And you and look, it's it's easier said than done because you actually have to be like really thoughtful every time you do that, right? But if you do that, people will show up. They will, and you can make sure you're aligned, right? So if you're like, you know, it's not just to check in and see what update you have for me, like that's lazy. Um, that's not really anything that's going to, you know, after a couple of calls be valuable for anyone else. They're going to be like, I don't need to get on this call. Like right. I have no update. I don't like have an update. What do you want me to do? Like talk to you just for five minutes? Just want to see how things are going. Just want to see how things are yeah, going. Exactly. Christy, so. Just check in and see how things are going. And I'm just telling you, and if you want to know, it's the other thing, you know, there's, there's a couple of bad behaviors um, that that breeds. One is people don't catch up, meaning, you know, how, how every one of these should start is re recapping the objectives from the previous meeting. Hey, in our last meeting here, are the four mm -hmm. things we talked about, here are the outcomes. And, and then the most, most critical question, the follow-up question is what's changed? And when you yes. go into the mindset that every customer interaction, everything has changed, that is how you stay sharp and on your toes. Yep. And I think what I see is that too often we go in and we're listening for cues or maybe we don't want to hear it, 
we don't want to hear that things have changed. Whereas, you know, when I've been, you know, running account growth teams or in the role myself, I just went in with every, I went into every customer interaction, assuming that I had to earn their business every time. And yeah. I think when you go in with that mindset to your point and I prep for the meeting, here's the thing, I'd find one or two articles that were pretty applicable across like 30 of my clients, right? Or like two yeah. or 10. So I wasn't having to necessarily reinvent the wheel every time, but, but I was able to add value and say, all right, this is what I've heard. Hey, here's something else I thought would be interesting for you. You know, take a look at this. All right, let me just tell you some trends that I'm seeing with some of my other clients about this. How have you all thought about that? And, and if you're not having that quality of a conversation, um, it's why people are not, you right. know, yeah, you know, kind of working through that. The so do there yeah. is, is go over everything that's already happened. They already know what's happened, right? So right. you revisit the last 30 days. You may bullet point and say, these are the things that we accomplished, but you focused on these are the things that we're looking to accomplish right, and put them into a forward thinking mode. And you're right, Jake, you, you bring different, um, you know, different vertical expertise to the market on what other customers are doing, that will capture their attention, that will keep them engaged with you. If you're just showing up with the donuts, now they already, they've already eaten, right? They've, they've got something else better to do. Well, especially like when Chrissy talked about going up the tiers, right, mm -hmm. which is, more and more as you go up the corporate ladder, the expectation, and you know, we can get into like adapting your communication style. It's a whole other kind of conversation here. So um, just all those things become more important. So, all right, so we've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about territory planning, uh, some good conversation there, talked about um, account planning, and now kind of account segmentation. And I can just tell you, like, if you, if you wanna reduce chaos, just go segment your accounts, build different tiers based on number of touch points and what you're, what's going to go into that touch point and then just execute it. Like Mike said, you know, like I really feel like one of the most underrated uses of outreach, for example, is customer success. Like why not put them into a sequence over the course of a year that says like month one, month two, month three, just so you're there and you've got those placeholders and you can, you can customize every touch point. I feel like it literally is the most underutilized aspect to just, you know, oh, you pull it up. Oh, hey, today I've got two conversations. Tomorrow I've got three. The next day I've got four. And gosh, just imagine like how much better would you sleep at night? If you're like, I don't need to worry about when I'm going to talk to Chrissy yet because I already know my system is going to take care of me. And yeah. I think for a lot of salespeople, that's, you know, I think one of the things that they don't do is they keep creating these fail points and, you know, they wonder why their, their life is chaos and why things, you know, struggle. Um, so, all right, so we've got a couple of other uh, sessions coming up here. We will not be uh, doing Jake and Friends next week. It's Memorial Day. Take some time off, all right? <laughs> go hang out, go barbecue, go play some golf, go do all the mem Memorial Day things that we all do. Uh, but we've got some great sessions coming up here. Um, you can take a look at the links down here. Um, Becca, I think we're also going to drop, I don't know, do we have that... Um, do we have the uh, navigating complex deals? I think I saw it in here. Um, there's a really cool piece of content we put out in the past. Yeah, here we go. I'm just gonna drop it in for everybody. So take a look at this. Take a look at that. And so a lot of the things I dropped in the account planning template there for everybody as well too. Um, and then I'm gonna drop it on LinkedIn as well. That should be very easy. Cool. All right. Well, look, I want to thank you both. I want to yeah, thank yeah. you, Mr. Mr. Mike, for joining. I think there's a lot of really great insights for everybody here. Chrissy, thank you for, for your help and assistance. Any parting thoughts? Okay. Any parting like, okay, here's what I, here's one thing I didn't talk about, but everyone needs to know as we wrap up. I, I think the only thing I would say is do your best to keep it simple because that is going to reap so much more from a reward standpoint. And when things start becoming overcomplicated with territories and account planning and comp and all this stuff, it, it never really goes to what you're looking for. And then the last thing I would say is always check yourself, including like your whole team on is what we're doing right now going towards our outcome, right? Um, and so many times people have this outcome. I want to hit this quota or this number, right, for our company. And they get caught up in things that actually have nothing 
to do with tying to that outcome. So you really have to make sure you're always focused on the outcome. It is, are these activities, are these actions, are, is this strategy that we're doing, whether it's from the executive team or it's individual contributor level, is that tying toward the outcome that we're trying to get to? Because if it's not, you need to reset um, and, and you're gonna be a lot more you know, successful. And because I think what sometimes is people want process for process sakes. They're yeah. like, well, we need to have this thing. And I think, you know, we talk about this internally, you know, Mike and, uh, you know, well, if we had this thing, it's like, okay, and how's that going to help to, you know, it's like, is this really what's going to move the needle? Is this really what's going to do it? Do we really need to go to territories right now? You know, or like what is actually going to move the needle? I think sometimes right, we, right. We, we try to think of things as being quick fixes when the issue is actually something that's more complex. Um, and a process or another SLA or, you know, move isn't actually what's going to help to achieve the outcome. Mike, last yeah. words, Two final things. takeaways. Absolutely. So at the rep level, don't be afraid to ask for help, right? Go to your leadership, go work with your leadership, ask for it. Leaders, coach and reinforce, right? Get down into the trenches with your team and show them the tricks of the trade and work together with them so you guys have a, a, a partnership and it's not just a one way, a one way street, right? Inspect, inspect, inspect and ask for help. I love that. Yeah. I, I set a meeting with, I think it's 28 or 29 with a VP of talent acquisition for Intel globally. Like I didn't run that meeting. I brought in my boss and my boss's boss and the COO, mm -hmm. like, and I just sat there with my like oversized suit, just like not knowing what to do. And I think I realized that early on of like leverage your executives and account planning. Like you said, a corp account planning is you're the quarterback. You know, you, you, you are the person who's doing it. You don't have to go do all the jobs. Yeah. You don't have to be the running back and the wide receiver and the offensive line. And, and so I think that that's, that's, that's amazing advice. So, all right, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Christy, for running a little bit over. I appreciate you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll see you on Friday. Take care, everybody.